So our Bible reading this morning uh, is found in Romans chapter 15, beginning at verse 1. If you're using a church Bible, it's on page uh, 1193. We who are strong ought to bear with the failings of the weak and to not please ourselves. Each of us should please his neighbour for his good to build him up. For even Christ did not please himself, but, as it is written, the insults of those who insult you have fallen on me. For everything that was written in the past was written to teach us, so that through endurance and the encouragement of the scriptures, we might have hope. May the God who gives endurance and encouragement give you a spirit of unity among yourselves as you follow Christ Jesus so that with one heart and mouth you may glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Accept one another then, just as Christ accepted you, in order to bring praise to God. For I tell you that Christ has become a servant of the Jews on behalf of God's truth, to confirm the promises made to the patriarchs, so that the Gentiles may glorify God for his mercy. As it is written... Therefore, I will praise you among the Gentiles. I will sing hymns to your name. Again, it says, Rejoice, O Gentiles, with his people. And again, Praise the Lord, all you Gentiles, and sing praises to him, all you peoples. And again, Isaiah says, The root of Jesse will spring up, one who will arise to rule over the nations. The Gentiles will hope in him. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in him, so that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. I myself am convinced, my brothers, that you yourselves are full of goodness, complete in knowledge and competent to instruct one another. I have written to you quite boldly on some points, as if to remind you of them again, because of the grace God gave me to be a minister of Christ Jesus to the Gentiles with the priestly duty of proclaiming the gospel of God, so that the Gentiles might become an offering acceptable to God, sanctified by the Holy Spirit. Therefore, I glory in Christ Jesus in my service to God. I will not venture to speak of anything except what Christ has accomplished through me in leading the Gentiles to obey God by what I have said and done by the powers of signs and miracles, through the power of the Spirit. So from Jerusalem all the way round to Illyricum, I have fully proclaimed the gospel of Christ. It has always been my ambition to preach the gospel where Christ was not known, so that I would not be building on someone else's foundation. Rather, as it is written, those who were not told about him will see, and those who have not heard will understand. This is why I have often been hindered from coming to you. But now that there is no more place for me to work in these regions, and since I have been longing for many years to see you, I plan to do so when I go to Spain. I hope to visit you while passing through and to have you assist me on my journey there after I have enjoyed your company for a while. Now, however, I am on my way to Jerusalem in the service of the saints there. For Macedonia and Achia were pleased to make a contribution for the poor among the saints in Jerusalem. They were pleased to do it, and indeed they owe it to them. For if the Gentiles have shared in the Jews' spiritual blessings, they owe it to the Jews to share with them their marital blessings. So after I have completed this task, and have made sure that they have received this fruit, I will go to Spain and visit you on the way. I know that when I come to you, I will come in the full measure of the blessing of Christ. I urge you, brothers, by our Lord Jesus Christ and by the love of the Spirit, to join me in my struggle by praying to God for me. Pray that I may be rescued from the unbelievers in Judea and that my service in Jerusalem may be acceptable to the saints there, so that by God's will I may come to you with joy and together with you be refreshed. The God of peace be with you all. Amen. And, uh, thanks, thanks to you all. It's good again to be here. That's great. Well, I want, uh, if this isn't too tough at this time on a Sunday morning, is to do a little thought experiment, or ask you to do one anyway, 
I want you to imagine, uh, this may be difficult, that you're a top missionary. Uh, you've, uh, you're really gifted, uh, you're highly trained, you're very effective, you've got great powers of endurance, and, uh, and God has filled you with his Holy Spirit, and you're greatly used. So what would you give 20% of your ministry years to? A fifth of your missionary, uh, missionary career, as it were. Okay, right, let's do something slightly easier. And let's go uh, to the way Jesus saw things, the Lord Jesus. And uh, he comes to the end of his earthly career. He's taught about the Ten Commandments, and he's going to give a new commandment. And what is it? Love one another. That's right. As I have loved you, one another. Love one another. And then he follows that up with a public prayer in John 17, and he, he prays these words uh, for us believers. May they may we, be brought to complete unity to let the world know that you sent me and have loved them even as you have loved me. So Jesus reaches the end of his earthly ministry and what's on his mind? And he emphasizes, doesn't he, that love and unity, oneness, go together. And we come to this chapter as Paul draws to a close in the book of Romans, this great uh, document. And indeed, as Paul draws to the close of his missionary career, certainly this section of it, he has a very similar concern. The last these sort of five chapters or six chapters of Romans, a big chunk of it, a large proportion of it, fundamentally is dealing with uh, Christian oneness and Christian love, um, that uh, God's people love one another, that God's people are one together. So this morning, as you can see from the outline in the order of service, um, that's the track I want to follow. I want to start off with looking at unity in the church, a particular local church, then look beyond this sort of local setting. I want to unpick Paul's prayer request, which comes right at the end of the chapter, and then wind it up with some applications for ourselves as churches. So, the first seven verses of uh, chapter 15 are tied up with uh, oneness in the church, unity. And it's really important, and it's very precious. If you think back at the, the life of Jesus and the way he spoke to his uh, own disciples, if you ransack the uh, New Testament, there is so much on how we are to love one another uh, and how that's to work out in us being one together. Um, and uh, it's a real preoccupation of the New Testament. Interesting to see how people pray. You can tell where people's uh, um, sort of heartbeat is when you listen to their prayers, can't you? Well, look at verses 5 and 6, because verses 5 and 6 are Paul's prayer at this juncture. May the God who gives endurance and encouragement give you a spirit of unity among yourselves as you follow Christ Jesus, so that with one heart and mouth you may glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. So as Paul prays, it's like what Jesus is praying. And he's taken up, uh, he's concerned that this church in Rome might have a God-given spirit of unity. He doesn't want them just to be friendly, jolly people. He wants God to give them a spiritual oneness which wells up from within them and between them. Do you see the difference between those two? One, sort of natural jolliness is nice and all the rest of it, but it's not the real deal. Paul wants something spiritual to come from heaven, a spirit of unity. Verse 6, he gets more uh, personal, doesn't he? He wants them to... Uh, to uh, have one heart and mouth. Often it's the mouth that threatens unity, isn't it? I think that's the uh, case. And we must remember at all times, as uh, James reminds us, that we can't glorify God our Father with our mouth if we're using it to tear down our sister or brother or whoever it may be. So let's just track this love thing in, uh, uh, as Paul deals with it, particularly in those earlier verses. Uh, what does love look like in church? Well, verse 1 sets the bar quite low. We who are strong ought to bear with the failings of the weak. We bear with people's failings. We don't please ourselves. Now, bearing, bearing with people, just thought I'd put this in, doesn't mean putting them right. Okay? If you bear with someone, you stop putting them right, if anything. Bearing with them, I say the bar is quite low, it just means putting up with other people. Now, it gets a bit more than that, as, the, uh, uh, as what he says uh, goes on. Uh, we're not to please ourselves. Rather, verse 2, we're to please other people, do good to them, and build them up. 
We saw Jesus doing that all the time, didn't he? He cut his disciples a lot of slack. He cuts you a lot of slack, and me as well. And he's concerned that we should be built up. He's all relentlessly positive, really, with his disciples. Okay, some negative stuff when he has to tick them off for this, that, and the other. But he is relentlessly positive, dear Jesus is. And so should we be, according to this. Verse 7, accepting one another. Uh, Living to benefit other people. That's what love looks like. This is a big deal. And so that, the takeaway at this point is that if you, brother and sister, have got a difficulty creeping in with someone else, you need to be very careful and you need to take action about it very quickly uh, because um, uh, overcoming difficulties between people is at the top of Jesus' agenda for us Christians and for a church. So if you know, even now, and you're thinking of someone, you know that a difficulty has crept in which could divide you from that sister or brother, then do overcome it. Bear with that person. Don't try and put them right. Build them up. Pray for them. Use your heart and mouth to love them. And if you can't, if it's got too difficult, too sticky, then get help. That's what Jesus so often did. He sorted out problems between disciples. And it's what Paul would say to, uh, you know this passage in Philippians, I plead with you, Odia, I plead with Syntyche to agree with each other in the Lord. I've just done that for you guys. But then Paul goes and says, yes, I ask you, loyal yoke fellow, or Syntyche, whatever his name was, help these women. And in Matthew 18, we'll find the same, that you can come alongside people who've got a difficulty and help them to get it sorted out. Because any division in a church is a disaster at a a deep level. It's a disaster for the church, and it's a disaster for the person or the people causing that division. So it's a big deal. Paul would write to Corinthians these words. See this in the context of, uh, uh, of the church being the temple of God. And Paul writes, If anyone destroys God's temple, God will destroy him. Now, division destroys churches. You probably know that. You may have seen it or experienced it, sadly, in your lives. Uh, uh, And so we need to be so careful on this. This is a non-negotiable. We must overcome division. Just thinking of the tongue tongue thing. The uh, uh, writer James says, what a great forest is set on fire by a small spark. Now, this uh, this is the agenda. Now, you may think you're doing all sorts, and we can very easily think I'm doing all sorts of stuff for the church, and what, what, what could possibly be going wrong, just a little niggle over there. Well, Paul writes also to the Corinthians, If I give all I possess to the poor, and surrender all my body to the flames, but have not love, I gain nothing. So do you see? Love, oneness, there's a huge amount at stake, isn't there? There's a huge amount at stake in the unity of this church, and the love that builds you guys together so much. So that's where we must always start uh, in, in, in our local churches. But I want then to follow Paul's gaze as he looks beyond the local. Because the most of this chapter, in verse from 8 to 22, is taking up with Paul looking across the Roman Empire, away from, the, from Rome itself, to God's wider work between Jews and Gentiles. And you've got this string of quotes, 9, 10, 11, 12, um, uh, of uh, quotes from the Old Testament. And he's going back there and he's saying, right from the day of Moses all the way down through the Psalms, it has been God's intention to build one church of Jew and Gentile uh, together. And, uh, and so the, the, the unity beyond the particular church, he's now looking at a really big picture, isn't he? Cross global, Jew and Gentile being brought together uh, to praise God together. That's the burden of those, uh, of those verses. Um, He's looking beyond the local. Now, clearly God gives different people different works to do. I'm the pastor of Eastern Evangelical Church. Phil is the pastor here. You've all got different works to do and different callings uh, within um, uh, your your, your particular church setting here. It was the same with the apostles. Peter was the apostle to the Jews and Paul was the apostle to the Gentiles. Uh, You can see that comes up in uh, verse 16. And he spells out his Gentile labours, his work amongst Gentile people like us, 
in verses 17 down to 22, and he does this sort of map of the world thing, or the Eastern Med anyway. And so you can see from that that his first priority as the apostle to the Gentiles is to bring the gospel to the Gentiles in this huge geographic area. 80% of his ministry life was given to that. But interestingly, what this chapter is mostly about is the other 20% of his ministry. The other 20% of his ministry was taken up or was to downwash from his visit to Jerusalem, which is where he turns in the uh, latter verses from verse 25 or uh, from verse 24 onwards. And he wants to visit Jerusalem, verse 25, to, to, make, to serve the saints there, the believers there. In what particular way? Verse 26, he's going to take this collection that Macedonia and Achaia had been pleased to make, and he's going to take it down to the poor saints in Jerusalem. There seems to be a poverty issue there. And he is taking uh, all this money collection down from these churches. Uh, over the previous year, it's taken him a year to do this collection, going around uh, Macedonia, and that means Philippi and Thessalonica, if you're thinking of Bible places. Uh, Achaia was Corinth, fundamentally. And uh, he, he's done this big collection. And uh, those churches wanted to make that collection, and he's going to be the courier. He's going to take it down uh, to the churches in uh, the, the church in um, uh, in Jerusalem. You can read about those collections. You can read about the attitude of those believers to money in Philippians chapter four and in two Corinthians eight and nine. So that's a bit of reading for this afternoon, if you wanted to follow up and see there see those things at work there. You see what those churches have done. It becomes clear here, verse twenty-seven, twenty-eight, is that. They didn't want to do just a charitable freebie. They felt a real obligation, a spiritual obligation, to take those, to collect and give those funds to the Jewish people. Why? Because they knew that they owed their very spiritual lives and salvation under God to, uh, to the church at Jerusalem, which had set aside people like Paul, had preserved the gospel and sent him out uh, to take the gospel beyond. So they look back and they say, we owe it to those people there. And that's why they want to make that collection. But this wasn't just a money transaction. If they had PayPal in those days, Paul wouldn't have used it. He wanted to take it personally at huge risk and great length of time uh, to go down there. After verse 28 after I've completed this task and made sure they've received this fruit, then I'll get on with doing some more missionary work in, 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 uh, in Spain. Actually, verse 28, I may have a version on your lap which talks about, after I have sealed to you this fruit. When the Bible uses the word like sealed, it's doing harder work than just uh, making a description of a money transaction. Something spiritual going on here. Paul, as the emblem of the Gentile Christians is going to seal it to them. He's going to take it to them. He'll seal it with his blood if that's what it takes. And it took a bit of his blood, as you may, as you may know. He's the fountainhead of Gentile Christianity under God, uh, Paul is, and he's going to take it to the Jews because he wants to see Jew and Gentile bound together. He wants this spiritual glue, this unity, this love to be really evidenced. Okay, it's going to be a tricky mission, and so we come then to Paul's prayer request in verses 30 and 31. And he knows that he urges them to pray, uh, uh, to, to, because this is going to be tough. If he's ever going to get to the Rome, if he's ever going to get to Rome via Jerusalem, he's going to need a lot of prayer to make it happen, because it's going to be very dangerous. From the day that uh, in Acts chapter nine, when Paul had been converted. Jews, in Jerusalem particularly and elsewhere, had been after his blood literally. You read Acts chapter 21, another bit of reading for this afternoon, when Paul, after having written Romans, in Acts 21, he arrives in Jerusalem. And you can see how it went for him there. It takes direct interventions a number of times. It took interventions from God to save his life. So Paul really needs their prayers and those prayers are answered. But what about the prayer request in the second half of verse 32? 
Pray that I may be rescued from the unbelievers in Judea. Get that, yeah. And that my re- so, uh, service in Jerusalem may be acceptable to the saints there. Now, why wouldn't it be? If someone came from London or from Jerusalem or wherever and bought a large sum of money to carry play an evangelical church, you'd take the money, wouldn't you? And uh, you'd be fine with that. What's the deal with the Jews and this money thing? Why could it not be acceptable? It's because of the chasm between Jew and Gentile in those days. I think it was in a couple of directions. Firstly, the the Jewish belief was just very different in style. You can see that in in Acts 21 when he turns up. They receive Paul warmly enough. They praise God for his ministry. Then they say this. You see, Brother Paul, how many thousands of Jews have believed, and all of them are zealous for the law. I expect Paul and Luke looked at each other then and said, did I hear right? Zealous for the gospel, aren't they? No, they said the law. That was a difference. You would have thought that was quite an important one. But Paul puts it down to style, it seems to me. Then these Jewish Christians get him to take a weird vow and to go into the temple Uh, and nearly gets him killed, and it does get him locked up for several years. This is costly. So there's a style thing, and it it has consequences. But let's come back to the chasm thing, which is the second of far more important. Because Jews, 2,000 years since the days of Abraham, all the way up to here, deeply conscious, we are different from the Gentiles. And that was present in the Jewish church, it would seem, as it was uh, uh, amongst uh, the the widest uh, spread of Jewish people. And frankly, as you and I know, old habits die hard. This is what uh, Paul is up against, and that's what he's asking for prayer, because bridging that chasm was Paul's priority, whatever the cost. Because division between churches was not acceptable to Paul. It had to be bridged for real. And so Paul gets to Jerusalem, knowing that what will cost because he believes this is so important, vital, to keep that miraculous, spiritual, spiritual unity between Jew and Gentile, whatever the cost. Because all those Old Testament promises, verse 10, 11, 9, 10, 11, 12, don't mean much unless he can put legs on and express the unity between Jew and Gentile. That's why he does this trip. It's really important to him that the Jews and the Gentiles together rejoice about God's blessings. He wants Paul's prayer in John 17 to, sorry, Jesus' prayer in John 17 to be really answered. May they be brought to complete unity to let the world know that you, Lord God Father, sent Jesus and have loved them even as you have loved me, says Jesus. To let the world know. Because the world doesn't know what it can't see. And it needed to see Jew and Gentile bound together in Christ to know the gospel was true. And so these last, last third of Romans is about putting legs on this spiritual truth. You know, all spiritual truth has an earthly demonstration in one way or another. The universal church is expressed in our local churches. The, uh, our belonging to God is expressed in our holiness. Your union to Christ is expressed in your baptism. And so I could go on. So this spiritual unity between Jew and Gentile, black and white, old and young, blah, 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 whatever it is, must be expressed. It's the gospel need of the hour. So Paul has done 20 years of church planting and evangelism. Now it's going to end up with him spending five years in pursuit of demonstrating the oneness of God's people. Because it is so important to him. And he therefore never regrets going to Jerusalem with all the inconvenience, the time it took, the pain it caused him, and the risks, etc. Because he thought the gospel need of the hour was to show that God's people are one. And so what does that mean for us? Churches like ours. Independent churches. Well, we need to be careful with that word independent. It needs to have another syllable in there. It needs to be interdependent, doesn't it? If we are self-contained, we're in danger of becoming a monstrosity. It's not right. We need to be bound together with one another if we're going to follow the... uh, We've got to put legs on the spiritual unity which we have in Christ across the body of Christ. 
We need to do it carefully. We need to do it wisely. So how do we do it? Well, we can start off, really, at verse 1, with just a goodwill and acceptance towards other, ch- other Christian churches. Be generous in spirit, generous to their needs. We need to get to know other churches. I'm very grateful for this opportunity to come and preach and to have Pete preaching down at, uh, uh, at uh, Eastney so that we can get to know each other as churches. Maybe we've got an opportunity to do things. We're really grateful for you guys, the way that you, uh, you host things like the FIC weekend. And, uh, uh, and uh, I know there's a real burden for this sort of unity between churches existing at Cow Plain. And uh, I praise God for that. Uh, and this is good. Uh, we need to learn to trust, develop good relationships, make that effort, work and play together and that sort of thing. Be prayerful for one another. But we're also bound uh, in, a, in, in a more formal commitment as churches, if I can put it that way. Um, uh, and churches down through the ages have always been bound in covenant with one another. Different church groupings have done it in different ways. But, they're, but, but churches have always been bound to one another. And there's been a right suspicion, actually, of churches which are out there on their own and fully independent in the, in the wrong sense as it were. There's a, we have a more formal uh, union, as it were, which is almost sealed before God. This is a seriousness with which Paul sees it in this chapter and with which we ought to see it in our own setting. Our formal commitment to one another, our, our, the covenant we have, is through FIEC, Fellowship of Independent Evangelical Churches. The word F, the F is not for fiercely, by the way, just in case... <laughs> So there's about 600 FIC churches. We, we understand that we are definitely answerable to God for our congregation here and, and, and there, or wherever it might be, but we're also united as a family in the gospel. And, and that seems to me, actually, to, to secure the balance rightly between our individual church responsibility towards God, you know, for your, your life as a congregation and so on, that is an individual responsibility, but also our wider responsibility that flows outwards. And, uh, and it's got a number of practical benefits. We avoid isolation, get encouragement, we pray for one another, we can do stuff together. The voice of FIC is 600 times louder, presumably, than any one of its member churches. That's another helpful thing. Uh, we were helped during our interregnum by uh, a brother coming over from the Isle of Wight to be our moderator at Eastney before I came. But those are not the prime reasons for being in a grouping and being covenanted together with other churches as we are in FIC. What I think the priorities of Paul in this chapter, I think the will of Christ and, uh, uh, and the other examples in Scripture make a strong case for churches being visibly joined uh, and truly sealed through thick and thin. And of course there will be thin times as well, won't there? There'll be times when uh, I mean, FIC costs money you know, it's, it's completely run by sinners. So uh, it's going to go wrong from time to time, isn't it? Just, uh, oh, like you guys, actually, yeah. yeah. Um, so you might find that we're embarrassed by some of our sister churches. I mean, but despite that, this chapter still applies. And I think we can go back to verses 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7 in this chapter and think of them in church-to-church relationships as well. We who are strong, are you a strong church? I think you are. Ought to bear with the failings of the weak and not to please ourselves. Each of us should please his neighbour for his good to build him up. For even Christ did not please himself. But as it is written, the insults of those who insult you have fallen on me. For everything that was written in the past was written to teach us, so that through endurance and the encouragement of the scriptures we might have hope. May the God who gives you gives endurance and encouragement give you a spirit of unity among yourselves, and if I could interpolate, between your churches as you follow Christ Jesus, so that with one heart and mouth you may glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Accept one another then, just as Christ accepted you, in order to bring praises to God. So there's a lot to follow there, isn't there? So uh, there's an example to follow. There's priorities to 
retain for ourselves. Yes, you, brothers and sisters, must prioritize love and unity and oneness in the congregation here. But then let it spill out to your sister churches more locally and particularly within those churches to which you, we are covenanted together in FIEC. So I commend this to you in Jesus' name. Amen. Can I just pray? Great God and Father, how we thank you for sending the Lord Jesus Christ to bind and covenant, a new covenant, to bind sinners into fellowship with you through the blood of Jesus. Thank you for your eternal purpose that your people might be bound together as brothers and sisters in churches and as churches together so that the world may see and know that you sent the son, your son Jesus that we might be forgiven and brought into fellowship with you. Grant us grace then to think on what we've heard today, to think and to be inspired by the personal example of Paul in his utter dedication to the Lord Jesus and to follow through the precepts of his teaching, to be reconciled to those with whom we may have difficulties through tears and perhaps at great cost, but for the sake of Jesus. And then help us as churches to work out what it means to uh, relate to one another, to accept one another, to build one another up in these days. All for the glory of Jesus. Amen.